Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology, activists uh, for here for a leap forward in medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. This ecosystem that has been set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network, and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Masco. Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. If conventional medicine is the medicine of the what and functional medicine is the medicine of the why, then this is the medicine of the when. We are going to be hearing from practitioners talking about biology and timing and biological rhythms. It's been a missing piece for functional medicine and Dr. Bland has wrangled some of the leaders, academics, clinicians, scientists to bring you the best of the best when it comes to understanding this new era of medicine. We're gonna hear the best of some of the talks and hear from the attendees. Check it out. So I'm here with the conference chair, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, and uh, we are going to get straight into it. Doc, there's been a number of topics on this uh, conference that have never been, as far as I'm aware, talked about at, at functional medicine conferences. And so I wanted to dive into that. And, and one of the things I wanted to start with was there was a question that you asked at the beginning that I felt was just a, a fundamental question that that could change the thinking. You're always into changing the thinking of practitioners. You want to tell us about why you came up, how you came up with that question and, and what the implications are of it? Yeah, yeah, thanks, James. So, you know, this whole concept of sleep, sleep has kind of got front and center now in terms of people's interest. And uh, it's often thought that uh, sleep itself is the cause of the problem. But I, I raised a question. I said, uh, is sleep the sleep disorder? Is it the cause or at the, is it the effect? And my answer to that, after listening now to these experts over the last couple of days, is that it's both. It's both the cause and the effect. It's like a chicken and egg or a dog chasing its tail type of situation in that if you have a sleep disturbance, as we're learning, uh, it influences adversely the rhythms of your body, your hormonal rhythms, your metabolic rhythms, which then creates uh, metabolic disturbance, which we call dysfunction and later disease. Similarly, if you have metabolic disturbance and uh, dysfunction, it creates sleep disturbances because you're not uh, rest and you're, you have pain or discomfort. So here we get in a tight loop that a sleep disturbance produces a problem, a problem produces more sleep disturbance, and now a person's locked in for years in this tight loop of dysfunction. So I think it's a really important new boundary layer consideration for any practitioner in the functional medicine community, remembering that the Nobel Prize in discovery of circadian clocks was just 2017. So we're in the front end of a leading new concept and that will really add tremendous value to personalizing therapy. Well, you've put quite a few sky miles in your time, and what does that do? <laughs> well, you know, I've thought a lot about that. Uh, I think that when you're traveling across time zones, uh, either domestic or even international, uh, we, we certainly recognize that this concept of altering your biorhythms is uh, absolutely factually correct. Now, the question was, could you train yourself, just like you train yourself as a conditioned athlete to do certain things you couldn't do untrained, can you train yourself to be more flexible in your uh, circadian rhythms that would respond to changing uh, time zones. And there does appear to be, from what we've learned, some accommodation. There, you know, there's certain kind of set genetics around our clock genes, uh, but they have some flexibility. So there is some accommodation in training proper, what we call sleep hygiene, eating right, exercising when you get to a new location, not just sitting on, on your bum and uh, hoping that the, the next day will come and you'll find a night's, uh, good night's sleep. But I think that there are certain things that we now are learning learning that can really wrap together a personalized program to make sleep a friend and not a not a uh a problem awesome yes uh, i know that's a big thing for so many 
you know, patients and, and practitioners, there's a couple of terms that I'd like you to, that I've heard this weekend that I never heard before, before that I'd love for you to sort of define for our audience and why they're important. The first that you said was synchrony. Um, how does that relate to, to clinical practice? Yeah, I think that's a really important term. You know, we uh, learned from Dr. Fred Turek, who was one of the presenters at the conference, uh, who is a world leader in, in uh, sleep research and in, in rhythms, uh, circadian rhythms, that uh, we not only have this central clock called the uh, uh, SCN, uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus that's in our brain that controls timing in our body, but that master clock then connects into clocks that reside in every organ and every tissue of our body. That they're like we have a liver clock and a heart clock and a spleen clock, and uh, and they they take their message from the master clock, but they have their own individual syncopation. So if they're out of synchrony because we have disturbed their function through altered diet, through altered lifestyle, exposure to toxins, uh, time zone changes. Now we have dyssynchrony among the individual clocks in our organs. So the times that we should be eating maybe are not the times that are regulating then the specific uh, synchrony of our clocks to get proper metabolic function. So the concept uh, that derives out of this is another term uh, called entrainment. Entrainment means that we get a rhythm where all these clocks are working in order, they're all adjusted to the right biological rhythms, and they produce in the hormonal tides of up and down, they produce the blood sugar control, they produce the insulin secretion, they produce the neurotransmitters, they produce the gastric juices, uh, they produce the, uh, the management of glucose metabolism, and all these things then are in the appropriate rhythms. They're entrained into positive health, which is re really the highest level of functional state. So how do you do that? You have to do that through consideration of your circadian rhythms, your sleep cycling, your nutrition, your exercise, and how that's personalized to the individual's own clock. Because we've learned that there's variability from person to person. And uh, some people are early morning uh, arisers, other people are late night people. And how do you then fit that into your own personal style? Yeah, and how, how does a how does a clinician best get into that with a with a patient? Like, are there are there sort of simple questions or things that you've learned along the way that you feel can really um, open up that dialogue with a patient who's maybe never considered that before? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that the uh, functional medicine assessment tools uh, provide is this timeline in which you start marking things like sleep cycling and and hours of good sleep and when you go to bed and when you arise and and what your comfort level is with your sleep patterns. These things are the first levels of interrogation that we really need to know about that really uh, historically it's it's been considered kind of a just a, a secondary bit of information. But now we're recognizing, and in fact, it was uh, said to us by several of the uh, experts that we had in, in this conference, that if we were to put together concepts of diet, exercise, and sleep, that sleep may be superordinate. It may be the number one singular thing we should be attending to, of which then how exercise and diet and nutrition play out will be controlled by the, the quality of our sleep pattern. So asking the right questions about sleep hygiene produces the ability then to intervene properly. That's so interesting. Well, look, if sleep is hot, the other things that are hot right now are fat, intermittent fasting, ketogenesis. So what have you learned this weekend or what are some things that, that sort of came across your radar that you think is really valuable for, you know, for practitioners out there who are probably seeing patients who last week started keto or, you know, are, are sort of on the train to biohacking or otherwise, or are just getting started with even thinking about changing their diet. What's, what's the emerging science in terms of what's the healthiest way to go about it? Yeah, I think you really just uh, said it beautifully that um, this is is a uh, quintessential example of systems biology in, in healthcare, and this is the whole basis of functional medicine, because you, uh, you can take any one component out of what you just said and look at it in the context of all the other components. It's a holograph. You've got to uh, look at the interconnectedness of all of these. So when we start really examining things like diet and uh, meal frequency and uh, fasting mimicking diets or time-restricted feeding or ketogenesis, we have to look at the aspect of how that interrelates then with that person's own specific genetic clock determined uh, rhythmic, rhythmic uh, effects. And there's no one program for everyone. We've learned that, right? So here's another variable that we need to be uh, attending to. So the, the general principle, I think, is that if you can sustain your uh, your your period of non-eating for 12 hours, 
um, that you then have an opportunity to re-regulate your uh, synchronicity or your entrainment of your clock genes across these multiple organs. So this could be a therapeutic approach for a person who may be out of rhythm. They're dysrhythmic. And so uh, putting themselves into a time-restricted feeding program to make sure that they uh, finish eating uh, in the day no later than, say, uh, 6 to 8 o'clock, and they don't resume eating anything until the next morning at 8 or 10 o'clock. So you get at least a 12-hour a a period of time, ideally maybe even 14 hours, of non-eating. That has been shown now to help reset the, uh, the entrainment, the rhythms, the synchronicity. So I think there is a close interrelationship between meal frequency, circadian rhythms, and, and metabolic outcome. Seems like the most important thing is to stop patients from being in this like uh, vicious cycle. Right, and then bring them, trying to bring them back into a virtuous cycle. Yeah, and I, and I think also in those times that you're eating, uh, let's say that you're you're pulsing your eating appropriately, then what are you eating when you're eating? Uh, and I think that we've recognized there are certain nutrients that are probably more problematic relative to clock uh, synchrony, like uh, high uh, long chain fatty acids of the saturated fatty acid family, like palmitic acid, appears to disrupt uh, clock uh, synchrony. So I think again, how you eat, when you eat and what you eat all become important as part of the tools that we're going to use to construct the proper sleep uh, patterns. Beautiful. Well, I know this was just kind of a, a you know one-off conference as part of this Mastering the Implementation series that, that you've been doing uh, for practitioners who are watching this and, and watch the show and just like, wow, I need to get into this. Where would you recommend that they, uh, where, where can they get this kind of uh, education moving forward? Well, I think, first of all, obviously, uh, the functional medicine training programs. Uh, secondly, you know, now with what you're doing, a video series of education tools that uh, will allow a person to do self-study. Uh, third, I think, is um, uh, we, we can you know, look at the Personalized Lifestyle Medicine website that has all sorts of resource tools and, and uh, learning uh, uh, resources that could be of help. I think by assembling that as kind of a self-learning program, a person can pull themselves up pretty quickly to uh, start implementing these concepts. Awesome. Well, I hope, as ever, with the Functional Forum, this is a spark to uh, catalyze your own learning at home. And, uh, you know, it seems like this is the, uh, the next frontier and something that I hope that if functional medicine can really get behind, you know, with, this, uh, with all this research coming out, can sort of be almost like a, a Trojan horse to take many of these concepts into mainstream medicine. Well said, and I think that is exactly true. This is another example of a leading at, uh, hopefully, what's the leading edge, not the bleeding edge, in new ways to really help people with chronic uh, health problems. That's it. Well, it's a great conference, really well put together. We've got some of the highlights coming up, so let's get into it. So let me just talk uh, here to try to set the context. Uh, my responsibility, I think, on the program this morning is just to maybe be the uh, warm-up band, to be the uh, kind of the icebreaker, to set the context for what is going to be an extraordinarily exciting uh, both basic science and clinical review of this concept of rhythms. <clears throat> and when we talk about rhythms, uh, you know, it, it, it harkens back for me into my undergraduate training with, with wave mechanics and, and entrainment and, uh, you know, the concept of constructive and destructive interference. And you, you could think of waves in pools and how waves ripple and, and you know, are we a particle or are we a wave, this wavical concept. And there's all sorts of interesting metaphors that come out of rhythms. But I think as we examine our lives, we recognize that uh, we are involved with interspersed many different rhythms that are going on within us. There's, as I'm seeing now, as my just past my 73rd birthday, that you know there's the rhythm of aging, and then, and then then there's the monthly rhythms, and there's the daily rhythms, and there's the solar annual rhythms, and I mean there's many rhythms on rhythms. It's a intercalation of like a, a, a clock or a watch with multiple gears that are turning us and, and regulating and inf influencing our, our phenotype, our physiology. And that's what we want to really explore, is how these things, this master uh, clockwork, all kind of sticks together and how it regulates or it influences uh, our, our performance as a human being. And I would, so I would call it, you know, this is another perspective on functional medicine. If our function is broken down into four quadrants or four areas, and, and maybe you would select more quadrants but, or more sections, but the four that I think you can aggregate or function to are the, our physical function, our physiological or metabolic function, 
our cognitive function and our behavioral or psychological function, which you then might even put spiritual in there and say that's a separate one. But those functional areas are ways that we could codify or metricize how rhythms of life are influencing us over the course of our decades of living. So when I think of that, then there, like, we go to the science, <laughs> the, the literature, and we see there's all sorts of papers that are coming out now that are exploring this from different perspectives. Here is just one shift work. You probably remember this paper that was published in JAMA uh, just a year ago or so uh, that really talked about uh, the health effects of shift work. And you start to say, well, why would shift work, meaning you know, changing the, the rhythms of time, influence people, at least on a statistical population basis, in such a way as to uh, influence their health in an adverse way? So what are the ways that that would filter down? And we're going to explore that uh, with experts in, in this extraordinary advancing field of uh, circadian biology. And I think it's a, it's a really major next step. And when I, um, when I think about this, I'm reminded of all of us on our learning curve. So for me, I flash back to 1978. I'm in San Francisco, if I can take you for a moment. I'm in San Francisco. I'm giving a seminar. Uh, to doctors. I'm thinking I have something to share about nutrition. And there's a doctor in the front row uh, who is very um, direct and adamant, and uh, there's no doubt that he has an agenda. And the agenda is that he wants me to talk about the importance of circadian rhythms. Well, I had nothing to offer at that point. I hadn't, uh, and, and so I, I don't think I hopefully didn't blow him off, but I certainly didn't fulfill his expectations because it was his belief in 1978 that all of health was really determined by the way that people were entrained in their rhythms. And I was not yet sophisticated, knowledgeable, or prepared to really address his issues. So over those years, lots has happened. I'd like to think I'm more prepared now, but we're gonna learn a lot from experts as to what's really going on in this, in this field at the cutting edge. This is a, kind of just a simple example. Some of you probably remember this, um, this paper that was published a couple of years ago in uh, uh, demography w in which they showed a map of the United States and then they talked about uh, the uh, time that people go to bed in different time zones. And so uh, you'll notice that as you move from west to east and you'll see those, those dark blue areas, that, that's where people tend to go to bed later. And they attribute this to the, not only time zones themselves, but also the uh, demands of their work, because work is where we spend so much of our time. So there's this concept of working late, getting home late, getting some meals quick because you ha didn't have chance to prepare a meal. I mean, there's many variables that tie together, uh, they're saying, with regard to time zones. And so as you get to the edge of a time zone, you have more demands on your time. You get to bed later, you're, f you're working later, and blah, blah, blah. Light, uh, light dark cycles are changed and that has a relationship, um, uh, an association epidemiologically with health effects in those, um, in those areas. So these are some gross <coughs> kind of determiners of things that we may not consider as important to our health. I've just inserted this uh, today into the slide set because I thought it was germane to what's going on. And, and I'll just say a, a quick word about this. I spent the last two days um, I downloaded the, the data set that's available in public access now from the uh, uh, extraordinary study that's been done on the identical twin astronauts. You're probably familiar with this, with the two brothers, one who stayed on land base and the other who was at Skylab. And um, the results of this, to me, are the most profoundly interesting single study in humans I have ever seen in my life on the influence of environment on gene expression and phenotype. Uh, this is just one of those bodies of work that the more you dig into it and the more you look at the data, the more you recognize that what we were told, what I was told as a student back in the 60s when I was in, in the medical school and PhD training uh, was uh, that there was this genetic hardwiring, these Mendelian rules, right, that we learned about genetics that gave us the impression that our genes, once they were locked in in embry embryogenesis, would just kind of stay constant and that's who we were and we didn't fill out an application card and, you know, if we got the bad luck of the draw, woe is us, but if we got the good luck of the draw, we were lucky. Um, and, 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 and so we just kind of had to live with whatever we were given. That was kind of the view, as gene determinism. 
But over the years, if you've been following, and certainly it's been a theme of my discussions in, in uh, my teaching over the last 30 or 40 years, is there's this emerging view that genes are a lot more uh, dynamic in terms of their expression patterns and um, have, there's more plasticity in genetic expression than we previously understood. But there's still been this thought that, okay, once the um, sperm and the egg meet and you go through the process of embryogenesis and you end up with an embryo and that develops into the fetus and eventually to the individual, that these concepts of genetic plasticity uh, pretty much stop and then you've got hardwired genetic outcome for the rest of your life. So that is it. Once you're an uh, air-breathing organism walking around in the earth, now they're pretty much set. There's not much genetic plasticity after birth. Well, Obviously, these astronauts were not embryos, and they were not fetuses, and they were not infants. They were adults. And so the question is, how long did it take uh, in an extreme environment, which is weightless space, for the gene expression patterns of the one brother to differ from that of his land-based uh, brother? And the answer is about, 20, about 48 hours, according to this data. You start to see already uh, epigenetic marks that are changing within their immune system uh, as a consequence of this new environment. Now, ad admittedly, most people, at least now, uh, unless SpaceX continues to evolve, are not going to be in weightless uh, environments, uh, in gravity-free environments, uh, probably most, most of their life. But this is a model ex uh, kind of extreme environment uh, study of what happens to gene expression when you put a person into uh, a changed environment. Do they respond quickly or do they have the plasticity? Uh, where does that plasticity occur? Uh, in this particular study is so dramatic because of all the things that were done uh, in, in the analysis. Um, this is kind of just a quick graphic that describes all the various things that were evaluated in these um, two individuals, uh, both during, uh, before, during, and after the, uh, the six months on Skylab. So biochemical, cognition, epigenomics, looking at methylation patterns and, and, and um, uh, effects on the epigenome, uh, gene expression patterns, that would be your transcriptomics and, and your proteomics, uh, your immune function actually differentially segmenting different subsets of the immune system to look at individual effects on both B and T cells and their subset populations. Um, metabolomics, uh, microbiomics, measuring the microbiome uh, populations uh, periodically throughout the uh, exposures. Um, the physiological, kind of phenotypic, and lastly telomeres, telomere uh, length. And uh, you see telomeres changing uh, rapidly and going, changing when you're in space and then changing back to some extent when you get back on land. So you can really look at the dynamics of how an environment influences then this complex array that we call our cells, right, that we call our, our bodies. And to me, this particular study, if there was ever a doubting person about the importance that lifestyle environment has on influencing our function, this should disprove anybody's doubt that, that this is a very dynamic process and that all these rhythms that, that we are engaged in are influenceable down to the genetic expression level. And so does diet influence uh, these gene expression patterns? And the answer is yes. Uh, food is information for our genes. I've been saying that now for more than 20 years. It's not just calories or micronutrients. It's food as information. And so we now know that uh, the uh, macro and micronutrients and phytochemicals as well all have influence on gene expression tied to our clock genes. So it, it, the nutrition can influence our clock r regularity and our clock regularity can influence our nutrition, right? So there is a, there's a kind of a push-pull uh, cycle that's involved with this network. And so we see diurnal oscillations in things like liver mass and cell size that accompany ribosome assembly now this sounds really like, wow, you're kidding me. You mean over the course of a day, our liver can swell because it's producing more protein and ribosomes that are occupying more volume, so it makes the liver get bigger and then, and then it gets smaller, so it's going in and out like respiration? And the answer is yes, that's what we see that's tied to circadian rhythms with protein synthesis, because proteins take up volume, right? So it makes the size of a cell different than when it's protein uh, been, been using that protein up uh, for function. And so we also recognize that uh, there's this coordination of the, uh, the diet with the, the rhythmic uh, effects of these clock genes at the, the, the cell-specific level. 
So the, the, we are really running this wonderful orchestrated ballet, this dance, all, every day. And that dance can be one of kind of chaos, or it be, be, might be one that's entrained into a high level function. And all these variables that we're exposed to are influencing uh, this, this rhythmic uh, beat. Let's use one example. This is one that I, I find quite fascinating. In the, in the family of saturated fatty acids, and we could probably go into some long riff about are saturated fatty acids good or bad, or you know what's the story, I want to just choose one of the family for a second, and that's the uh, palmitic acid, which is the uh, C16-0 saturated fatty acid um, member of the family, and look at its effect. And it turns out that palmitic acid, which we find in feedlot-fed beef, <laughs> You probably already know that I'm not a really big proponent of feedlot-fed beef, but anyway, whatever it is, uh, that palminic acid, that particular saturated fatty acid, can induce what's called the jet lag effect. Now that's interesting. How does it do that? It does that through this complex network that I'm showing you of epigenetic modulation of influence of the expression of uh, clock genes. And, and so therefore, if you eat, like I'm thinking just as an analogy, what happens if you go out and have a martini and a big, huge steak dinner at 10 o'clock at night, right? Uh, with this wonderful, highly marbled beef uh, that's very tender and succulent. And then you try to go to sleep. <laughs> that you, you may run into some issues, right? On a number of different things. You might have the alcohol as a component, but you might also have this heavy, heavy load of saturated C16-0 fatty acids that are, are actually influencing the expression of genes that are trying to regulate your master chronobiology. So here is an example of gee whiz, you know, um, a nutrient has an effect that we have now measured on this complex process of, uh, of circadian expression. So obviously there's this interplay between clock genes and nutrition. Uh, that then begs the question, what about time-restricted feeding or fasting mimicking diets? Can we re-entrain the clock genes if we put a person onto a different kind of dietary rhythm uh, to re-establish some kind of uh, uh, a, a, a more uh, rhythmic uh, chronobiological pattern? And so there is more and more data coming out looking at how different types of diets, so the ketogenic diet or the time-restricted feeding diet or the uh, um, fasting mimicking diet, all of these, how they influence uh, uh, clock gene regulations and, and chronobiology. So I think enough of that. And so does that then uh, have anything to do with uh, things like lipid metabolism and, and blood sugar and the deposition into the adipocyte of um, uh, energy that is stored for a rainy day that never comes that we call obesity? And the answer is yes, that uh, we can uh, see that there's an interrelationship between not only the microbiota, as, as we know, and its relationship to obesity. And I'm going to go and tell you in just a moment that the microbiota has its own circadian rhythms too, so it plays a role in this. And then there's also these uh, dietary factors, all of which then relate to how energy fuels of the body, fat and glucose are metabolized and how, and how and where they're stored. So uh, we might say part of the obesity crisis could be tied to alterations in chronobiological rhythms and how that uh, relates to stress factors and how that relates to eating patterns and exercise and sleep time, all these factors interrelating. All right, we are here in the practice implementation showroom here at the PLMI conference. And if you don't know, our latest sponsor here at the forum is the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. Let's go and take a look. Obviously, there's a lot of people checking it out because it's awesome. So, you know, one of the things you'll see and why we're super excited about it is there's a lot of patient education that is not being done very efficiently because it's been done face to face. People don't remember what you say. So you need things like this, like this is from the cardiometabolic uh, one, which is Dr. Shilpa Saxena's. How many times have you had to uh, uh, communicate how inflammation plays a role in cardiometabolic disease? A lot, right? So how do you help patients to remember that and communicate that to their spouse or their family members or their other doctor? You have a really easy tool like this atherosclerosis, a chronic inflammatory condition. So these kind of tools are super valuable to be able to back up what you're telling patients in a really easy way. So that's one of the things, there's five different issues. You've got stress, there's um, HPA axis, there's uh, cardiometabolic, there's gut. 
Let's also check out over here. This is the reason why I initially loved uh, the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center was because of the group visits, right? We're going to be hot on group visits, uh, for, you know, for the foreseeable future. But these tools, the group visit toolkits, make it super easy for you to run your first group visit. Patients love it. Doctors love it. It is the way that functional integrated medicine is going to make it to the masses. So these group visit toolkits make it super easy to run the group visits, optimize presence and influence, increase revenue in less time, inspire hope and empowerment. That's what we're all about. So go to goevomed.com slash GVT, group visit toolkit, goevomed.com slash GVT to find out more about that, and goevomed.com slash LMRC to find out more about the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. Check it out. All right, we are here in Chicago with Dr. Anna. We have a great Facebook relationship, but it's the first time we've met in person. Absolutely. Doc, what do you think of the conference? Well, this is awesome. Thanks for sending out that newsletter because that's very important in terms of dispelling, dispensing information. So I've had a great time. So I, I hear you have a big, uh, a big, it's going to be a big moment in you announcing something you're going to do in your practice. Tell us what you're going to commit to. Yes, I am. So I followed you for a couple of years, and one of the things you've really emphasized is the micro practice. So come July, I am going to be setting up a micro practice in the south of the suburbs, which is where I live. And then yesterday, I became very present to the repetition about group visits. And my passion is diabetes. And so I'm thinking, and I actually listened to one of your group visit uh, podcasts last night on my way home. Okay. And so I'm really thinking about starting group visits with diabetes as a niche because I also wrote a book and I think it's really a great way to get a group of people together that have a common goal of wanting to either reverse their blood sugars or improve their blood sugars, but creating that community. Yeah. Are there enough people with type 2 diabetes in the southwest suburbs for you to help? Well, I'm sure there are, given the statistics that we currently have about 29 million people living with type 2 diabetes and an additional 86 million living with borderline. So I'm sure I'm going to have more than enough people to work with. Well, you heard it here on camera. Chris did an amazing job yesterday of actually sort of taking out each of the reasons why people wouldn't want to do it and now I'm really excited that you're going to do it. I know it's going to make a big impact on your community and look with a micro practice you don't need to own the space where you do the you know where you do the uh, group visit you can do it. Any ideas where you could do it? Well right now I'm thinking about um, using a physical therapy space that has a yoga studio and I'm sure by the time I it comes to July there'll be more than enough spaces opening because as you know when you put the intention out the universe opens up. All right, you heard it here first. Diabetes group visits in the southwest suburbs of Chicago. Good luck, and we look forward to doing a podcast next year. Thank you very much, James. My pleasure. Hi, my name is Jeremy Kubitschek, and on today's One Minute Tip, I want to talk to you about the idea of the golden rule versus the platinum rule. Most of you know the golden rule, do unto others as you'd want done to yourself. The platinum rule is actually do unto others as they would want done to them. One of the things I've learned in my company, Giant, is when we work with people, the idea is if you can understand and know other people and their wiring and begin to lead them based on how they would want, then engagement goes up. When you begin to lead the way that you think that you would want to be led, most people comply. So the idea we've come up with in the five voices is simply every person has a different voice. And if you understand that voice and allow their voice to really be elevated, whether it's patients, engagements, or staff, then they'll start to have engagement, not compliance. And it's all predicated on the simple idea of understanding other people, doing unto others as they would want done to themselves. All right, I'm here with Dr. Brad Dyer. He is a physician practicing in Kansas City. And um, Doc, what do you make of the, uh, of the conference so far and what's been some of the things that you learned? You know, probably my two best takeaways uh, for Monday morning. Uh, I'll start with one, the easy one. It's just all the junk light that we're exposed to. Just getting blue light blocking glasses in my patient's hand or having to turn on night shift, that's probably the easiest thing that I'll do right away. I do that a little bit, but I'm gonna make it much more of a priority. Uh, probably the second biggest takeaway was the timing of our feeding. You know, it was interesting, we're all doing a lot of intermittent fasting, which I think is awesome, but the easiest way for most people to do intermittent fasting is just to cut out breakfast. But what I'm learning this weekend is what our circadian rhythms prefer is to actually have the majority of your calories earlier on in the day. You know, we've heard that expression, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. It turns out there's a lot of truth to that. And also, 
you know, with a lot of the high fat diets, keto diets and stuff that we're doing, our body handles saturated fats so much better in the morning. And so just trying to shift people on a high fat diet to get the majority of those fats early in the morning and then maybe more just like the vegetables and stuff in the evening. And if you're going to do intermittent fasting, I know this is difficult just based on our culture, but try to have the earliest or the more of your calories earlier on in the day and maybe skip dinner if that's practical for some people. Yeah, it seems like uh, that's that's um, a big shift. As you said, most of the literature or most of the, not the literature, but people trying to make it easy for people to do it. It's just like, yeah, skipping breakfast is the easiest way. Um, you know, I feel like uh, there's some... Um, beyond sleep and beyond food uh it, it it's really incredible how this conversation sort of permeates into all areas of patients lifestyles oh yeah absolutely you know just people's stress and how it affects their sleep and then how sleep again in turns affects the stress and just how it affects hormone regulation and thyroid regulation and you know and so that gets into anxiety or depression or obesity i mean it just it ties into everything and and really making sure that you're focusing on sleep is super, super important. Seems like this is the next uh, next level for functional medicine, right? The when, we've got the why, now we're getting to the when, and uh, I think a lot more practitioners will start speaking about it a lot more in the future. No, I agree 100%, you know, and it's, it, it's so in line with almost everything in functional medicine. There's so many people in this field that have known this for years and years and years, but the data and the science that are coming out now just solidifies what they've been saying. And with that in, you know, combination, people are going to start really listening, and I think it's going to make a big difference. Awesome. Well, check out Brad Dyer, Premier Integrative Health in Kansas City. Great to have you here, Doc. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. I'm Betty Murray. I am the CEO and nutritionist at Living Well Dallas. And my community tip today is... Behavior research shows that people can only handle one to two changes at a time. So as a practitioner, you want to be able to pick out the stages of change where your patient is and use change over time to be more effective. So one of the myth busters here at PLMI has been Dr. Tom Williams. And for those of you who have heard him lecture before, you know he is a fountain of knowledge when it comes to science and the interpretation of science into clinical practice. He gave a great talk earlier. Here are some of the highlights. So if we are going to be talking about stress and the brain, we have to talk about the HPA axis. And so we're super excited to welcome for his Functional Forum debut, Dr. Tom Williams, uh, one of the best uh, liked and best followed uh, researchers and clinicians on the uh, circuit here in functional medicine. So, uh, you know, we've been talking about stress and the brain. Um, why is the HPA axis such a, a critical component to that conversation? So obviously the HPA axis is our, our surveillance for stress. So it, it not only tells us what's stressful outside, um, you know, things that are going to threaten us from, from external, you know, think of, you know, the old idea of being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, these kind of things. But really it's more so than we think is actually regulating what's going on in the body. So if our blood sugar is low, if our blood pressure is not right, um, if our temperature's off, the, the brain, the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, is got to manage that. And one of the big things that we're talking about today is sort of managing that on a circadian rhythm. So it's also designed to help us anticipate the, the metabolic needs or even the stresses of the day. So it's really the regulator of all those things. So it's, we have to talk about it because it's, it's running the show. Exactly. One of the things that I heard you speak a little bit about was um, the, the power of this sort of cortisol awakening text, test as a way to um, get some information in that way. Why, why, you, uh, why do you think that test is, uh, is, is important for clinicians to understand? So if you're trying to measure the body, you want to measure it when it's under some sort of provocation or when it's being tested in some ways. And so we, we try to measure, a lot of people would take the saliva test and they were always missing sort of that window at the very beginning from the time you wake up until about 30 to 60 minutes. They would typically only take one uh, of those samples. And when you look in the literature, you realize that most researchers want to use provocation. So it turns out waking provokes us. It's a stressful event. And so the only way to know that response, what we call the cortisol awakening response, is to measure it right away at the beginning of awakening and then usually 30 to 45 minutes later and then you watch it fall down later. And researchers, probably that's the single most used biomarker when it comes to cortisol measurements for sure and linking that with other stressful 
you know, stress-related co- conditions. So um, surprisingly, most, you know, a couple of years ago, most of the labs didn't include that. Um, and thankfully now several of them are beginning to use that so that clinicians can correlate the data with their patients with, you know, actually dozens and dozens of research papers, probably hundreds by now, showing how cortisol awakening response is, is affected by different stress-related conditions. Super interesting. You know, one of the things that came up was uh, this, uh, you know, how comfort food plays into this. And uh, I'd love for you to share with our audience a little bit about that, because I thought that was pretty profound as someone who's uh, wanted it and eaten it and not sure why. Yeah, well, we all, we all know, you know, that salt, fat and sugar are those things that, you know, we often crave, especially when we're stressed. And, and there's actually a connection there. Um, you know, the brain and the HPA axis not only affects our feeding cycle, so there's a whole ramification of how that works really to, to help our energy. But when we have a high amount of perceived stress, people choose foods that, I mean, if you ask them, are those healthy foods, they probably, they probably know that those aren't healthy foods. But as it turns out, when you look at the chemistry, we're craving some of those foods because we're trying to use our foods to manage our glucose levels or our blood pressure levels or some other factor like fatty acids, which are, are mo- modifiers. So it's not surprising that we choose those kinds of foods. And if you look at animal and human studies, it actually does help. I mean, help in the sense that it's temporary. It actually manages something going on in the stress response. But long term, when we're not letting other tissues manage their own glucose and manage their own blood pressure, and we're eating our way uh, into a solution like that, we know that that's bad. So those tissues lose their metabolic reserve, and it starts that cascade of metabolic diseases, whether it's diabetes, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis. You look at whatever tissue is the most vulnerable, when you put it under stress long-term like that, they will fail. And we'll, we'll maybe label it with a different disease name because we won't always connect it back to chronic stress, but it'll still have a, a genesis in this chronic stress model. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more just to, to encapsulate that about metabolic reserve? Because I feel like that's a concept that um, seems to be something that m- most clinicians, no, no matter where they're working on the scale, need to be really in tune with to understand the, 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 the sort of the genesis of chronic illness. Yeah, so, I mean, people use different terms, um, but I, I try to use this idea of like a rubber band going back and forth. What is the resilience of a cell or or a a tissue to be able to withstand some metabolic stress and snap back. And so that has to happen all the time. You know, all things are changing all the time. And so our bodies are designed to to expand and come back like a spring or or, or like a rubber band. But then there's got to be sort of a reserve, uh, antioxidant reserve, energy reserve. We can go down the list of all the different reserve capacities. We think of neuroplasticity. We think of detoxification capacity. All of these reserves that are, that are designed to restore that physiological resilience, those begin wearing away as we need them, as we're using them in stressful situations. And the physiological resilience is sort of like, it's like that battery power. As we're recharging the battery, we can always start the engine. But as the battery is depleted and depleted, as our reserves are depleted and depleted, think of uh, bone mineral density. As that's being depleted, all of a sudden now we put uh, pressure on it and there's a fracture. So almost every tissue has what we might call this, this metabolic reserve, and it's slowly wearing away as we age and as we put more and more stress on it. So we... The difficulty we have is how do we measure that? And I think there's some interesting uh, new insights and ways of doing that. But talking about like the car, looking at provocative tests are ways of maybe looking into measuring what kind of reserve capacity we might have left. Awesome. Well, Doc, I really appreciate you always being on the cutting edge and uh, sharing some of these insights with our practitioners and look forward to uh, having you back on the forum. Thanks so much. We're also going to have a few of the segments from Tom's talk from PLMI. So uh, check out some of the best bits. So today I'm going to remind you, at least from my perspective, and I think the perspective of most of the people speaking here, that maintaining circadian rhythm uh, is probably, I don't know, we could always say it's the most important thing, but it's one of the key important things that if is not being accomplished by your patient is gonna make everything else you do much harder, like pushing a boulder up a hill if, you're not, if, if the patient is not taking care of this issue. So again, um, these signals can come from all different areas, not just 
um, what we traditionally think of as circadian or circadian controlling uh, capacity. Almost everything, in fact, we could probably go around the wheel and say almost everything uh, that we do or don't do has some circadian uh, influence on, on, our, on our physiology. So as a reminder uh, to where I left off a little bit is that the, the HPA axis, both because of its circadian signaling and its stress consolidation, are triggering um, cortisol primarily, at least in this context, um, and it's creating this sense. And I, if you remember last time, I said that the signal that comes from the suprachiasmatic nucleus that triggers this on a circadian basis has this ultra dian, which means multiple day pulse, pulsing, okay? And that pulsing is actually what synchronizes and helps synchronize the circadian glucocorticoid signaling in the cell, okay? So if, it gets, if you get this signal in the morning where cortisol is higher, the cell is going to be with other, with the BMOL and clock genes going on, it's gonna know that that is a resynchronizing signal. Whereas later in the day when you may exercise and your cortisol goes up, the cell is gonna recognize that that level of cortisol is not a resynchronizing signal. Okay, does that make sense? Because the, is, while it's subtle, these, these, they come to the cell in different ways. Okay, now over time, Chronic stress, however, is going to modulate the glucocorticoid response of the cell. So as it's, as it's adapting to long-term stress over years, the glucocorticoid sensitivity, the glucocorticoid receptors are changing, and those will then influence the circadian synchronicity because they are now going to blunt or change, uh, probably more like blunting the ability for cortisol to resynchronize that cell as well as it did before you had all that chronic stress. Okay, so the gold standard way to tell if you have a good HPA axis is not to throw you out of an airplane, although that is used in clinical trials, uh, with a parachute that is, um, or many of the other ways we can stress people. Um, it's actually induced hypoglycemia. So we have the peripheral clocks, and those would be the clocks in pretty much all tissue have that clock and BMOL circ uh, circulation and uh, they might be functioning slightly differently in every sort of tissue, but they would have that circadian rhythm. But we also have that master clock, which is in the brain, which is in the hypothalamus, in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and the signal that tells the kidney, remember we talked about a, a, a range of anywhere from 24 to 25 hours. Well, eventually you don't want your kidney and your liver and your heart to be not know what time it is and they're all keeping their own clock. So there has to be some central clock that begins to synchronize all the clocks in these cells. And so that's hap that happens from the brain in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this is another picture of that. And so we have this master clock here. And obviously there's other uh, clocks which act a little, let's say, let's say higher priority clocks in other parts of the brain, but then we have all of these peripheral clocks in all the other tissues. And we have uh, from the German word timekeeper or time giver, we have this word Zeitgeber, which is used as some sort of synchronizing trigger that comes from outside the body that allows for the signal to, to entrain um, the, the central clock and then eventually the peripheral clocks. And we're gonna see here probably the, the strongest that we know of is light and darkness. But as we'll see here, feeding schedule is actually a very potent Zeitgeber, especially when uh, light is um, not there. And activity. Actually there are, when you're physically active, you can transform and begin uh, triggering um, activity as well. And so the last one that I was gonna mention here is the gut microbiota, and we don't, I mean, I put dashed lines here because we don't know exactly what are the signals. Do the, is the gut microbiota signaling the brain, uh, or is it signaling uh, other peripheral, and it's probably a little of both, and I know we're gonna have that discussion later, but that's another sort of external signal that we need to be thinking about. So this is a very important component of maintaining circadian rhythm, is the connection between the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain, and all the peripheral clocks in all the other tissues. Instead of a Zeitgeber, I call food a Zeitburger. Okay? 
So food is a Zeitberger. And ironically, I think it's kind of funny that a lot of the pictures that we see in some of these journals actually show a little burger uh, and, and fries as if that's the, pow the food uh, rhythm there. So as you can see here, that f f eating signals or the, the, feed, you know, the, the feed cycle, the, the desire to eat and all these things, much of that comes from the brain. But the signal that goes to the peripheral clocks is oftentimes coming from the nutrients in the food and the timing of those nutrients that come into the food. So we're going to see here so that all the circadian signals that I, that I talked about, whether it's glucocorticoid signaling, direct innervation signaling, um, uh, body temperature signaling that's coming from the brain, um, is also being mixed at the peripheral clock level with nutrient availability and the types of nutrients that are there. Is it upon seeing the food or eating the food? Much of what we know from the literature is upon the nutrients themselves. Um, but there, the, the idea of digestion beginning when you see or hear food, um, there is a digestive pattern that begins with that, um, the whole Pavlov idea. And if you ask my dogs when it's time to eat, five o'clock. Okay, they, they will go down by their bowl anytime. So they, they know what time it is to eat. So there's, there's, it's a little of both, but most of the data we have is upon the available of the nutrients themselves. So there's lots of things that have been measured, and this is just a review article that talks about the signals that come from the suprachiasmatic nucleus into the different tissues to trigger the preparation for eating. So hepatic enzymes, pancreatic, uh, enzymes, insulin sensitivity, uh, gastric emptying, uh, motility in the gut, uh, pancreatic enzyme output, all of these things are being managed in a, um, let's say there's a background, in, a background of circadian um, activity that is constantly preparing the body for what is coming next. And so, you know, we can go back to cortisol, the cortisol awakening response is designed to prepare us for that day and it's higher in days where you're anticipating more activity, it's lower on the weekends when you're expecting to do less, okay? So we see this, now obviously these things are preparing us, but the, they then spike when the actual event happens like eating. So again, there's, we have lots of factors in the nutrient metabolism world that are being managed on a circadian pathway. Hi, my name is Meg McElroy. I am a physician assistant and I co-own a practice called the Center for Collaborative Medicine. And I am new to the world of marketing myself and as somebody who does not like to be in front of the camera, I started doing marketing by doing a PowerPoint video and doing a voiceover for it. And that is something I recommend for practitioners and also it's a good way to show patients how you address uh, particular conditions. So I started with fatigue and I moved on to metabolic syndrome and thyroid and it's really easy to do and I highly recommend doing that as a way to get started on uh, showing what you do for the community and how you do it because people want to know and it gets your name out in the community. My tip for the practitioner community is to own whatever you're doing fully, unabashedly. Own it like the world needs it. Stand for it. Talk about it. If you're speaking to video in particular, speak to it with conviction so that people don't have to choose. They just know because they feel your truth and your authority. Seek out ways to collaborate with people who can do the, the important work, but the work that might not be in what you have time and space to do. So. Find yourself a, a health coach that's taking on the behavior change for your patients. It's super important work and we got to get the world hooked on habit change. And with that, find yourself someone to collaborate with to do that kind of work with your patients. So it's been a great mixture of heady ideas and research, but also some great practical tools. And one of the most practical was Dr. Christopher Moat. He is a physician from Colorado and gave some really practical steps on how to implement personalized lifestyle medicine. Check it out. 
So that's, that has, those are the things we've done to capture clinical effectiveness. Uh, the functional medicine being the big one and all the testing up front is a huge one. And then the uh, living matrix to help me get the data that I need in and keep these to 40 minute appointments. So now on the, on the profit side, and this is where, you know, I was told that once upon a time, we're not supposed to compare our fee structures because then we're colluding. But I'm just gonna tell you right out what things have been like. We're coming up on our third year in business next month. And so in our first full year, uh, with just myself, um, we generated about a million dollars in revenue, and then uh, costs were pretty high, so I only kept about 35% of that. In our second year, we uh, landed at 1.4, and our costs were even uh, about the same, 40%. And this year, we're trending uh, at about 2 million in revenue. My costs went up again. So anyway, I've learned about my practice that it can generate and churn a lot of revenue. And I don't like doing all the work myself, so I've hired some great people. And so your payroll goes up. And I still make a very nice living, but I share it with a lot of people. So um, what you see there in the pie chart is that 33% uh, of our total revenue comes from insurance reimbursements. Just 33%. I think that's pretty fantastic. So when they say, Dr. Mo, we're not going to raise your fees uh, this year. In fact, we're giving you a fee cut. When uh, they deny my claims, when, um, when anything happens and insurance says we're going to change the rules for you, we're not as dependent on them to do it right. That's not our primary revenue. In fact, that 37% is something we call a functional medicine fee. So hear me, this is the key to getting paid. Right? When you do functional medicine and you can't work like I couldn't work, 20 patients a day to churn those insurance reimbursements, how are you going to get paid? Because if you try to add money to your office visit fee, that's insurance fraud. We all know that, right? Okay. So we're not going to do that. So I looked at concierge practices. That's $2,000 just because you like me. You don't get anything back. Well, maybe you get a bigger blood test and a longer appointment. But I don't want to give them my cell phone number. I don't. So the concierge fee just seemed a little too exclusive for me and we don't like it, but if you guys works for you, great. The membership fee I didn't like for much the same reason. If you don't wanna pay, then you don't get to be in the practice. What I was looking for was a model where if you need the care and you're willing to pay for the care, you can have it and pay for it. And if you don't, we have a PA who will see you for insurance fees. Sore throat, come on in. Annual wellness visit, you see Kyla. She does all of my primary care. I'm the, the medical detective. I'm doing what I'm passionate and good at. And she is, I pulled her from an urgent care clinic. She loves the simple, fast cases. She likes to see 20 patients. And she was from a small town of a small suburb of Olathe, Kansas. Anybody from around that area? She was the only medical office open in some days, and they would just open the door one day a week and say, come on in, you don't need an appointment, she'll see everybody who comes in. And she would see 30 patients in a day. So this is the person who takes all my urgent acute care stuff that says, yeah, I've got an opening, bring them in, right? And I'm over here doing my functional medicine thing saying, oh, oh, you need to see her for that because I'm not gonna get you in for six weeks, so you don't wanna wait for your urinary tract infection to see me. So we have divided the labor, we, we collaborate, but my point is, that 37% is the functional medicine fee. So back to that. I charge patients like an accountant or an attorney. I'll take the contracted rate for what's in the room, right? If I see a patient for 40 minutes, I bill my 99215 or 214, whichever one I think I can get away with, their high deductible plan, their copay, whatever they got, and we fight for that. But that 135 or 175 bucks isn't gonna pay for my time when I'm here evenings and weekends. So I charge patients like an accountant or attorney and you pay me even when you're not here. And we lump that all under a fee called a functional medicine fee. Now I tried billing that for about a year and always reaching out to healthcare attorneys but they kept saying, well Dr. Moat, that code you're using isn't really the right code. Okay, well I'll switch codes and I, tr I tried and tried and tried. We weren't getting paid. Finally, one of the healthcare attorneys in Denver said, you gotta stop that. Just tell the patients they have to pay for it. There's no billable code and you're gold but good luck, they're not gonna pay you. And I'm like, well, you don't know. So we tell patients our functional medicine fee is 350 bucks, okay? And we're gonna charge you that based on your case complexity. And I feel like a fair measure of case complexity is how many times do you need to see me before you get your health goals? How many times do you come in the office? And the average patient sees me six times in nine months before they get what they want or they're frustrated and they leave. 
usually the former. So if I see you six times, you get to pay 350 six times. I don't collect that at the desk because that's too close to upcharging them for an office visit. We have a monthly thing that we, we just bill them for that, credit card on file. You've got to protect that information. But the point is, we keep that completely separate. And we give them statements all the time saying, you've seen us four times, we've collected that fee four times, and that never comes across the front desk. It's done in the back office. But my point is, those functional medicine fees pay me and my staff for everything we do, and you guys know what I'm talking about. When you get 17 pages of report, you're probably not just walking in there to talk to them. Oh, look at this, let's, let's look at this test together. No, you've been through the test before they come through the door. You've gotten down what you wanna say. You've probably written a template. You've done the work. And you did it in the evenings, you did it on the weekends. So your functional medicine fees pay for your time. And as you can see here, that's our biggest share of revenue. Okay. That 22% is uh, supplements, and then the 8% is my nutrition therapist. She's not really a revenue. <laughs> She's great. She's what helps the patients, but she doesn't make me a lot of money. And our IV therapies, we're not, we're not great with IV therapies yet. Okay. So the profits have been exceptional um, when we do it that way, and we feel like we are staying far away from any ethical and legal lines. We've vetted this out with more than one healthcare attorney in Denver. Um, now here's the best part. Our office is four days a week. It's closed on Mondays, so, and we're not open on Saturday and Sunday, so we work Tuesday through Friday. And if you ask any member of my staff, these 10 hour days are brutal, right? Because you're trying to do five days worth of work in four days. And a lot of doctor's offices work four days a week, but we've done four in a row, and by Friday evening, everybody needs a three day weekend. And that's what we have. Um, we also try to start people with liberal vacation time. Uh, we just this year got to add uh, Humana health benefits for everybody, so we can offer that. And so um, it, it is something where we know everybody's going to work hard and then they're going to recover and work hard and then recover. For me personally, to, to put some time back in my day, I went to a scribe that stays in the room and I loaded Dragon software when they're not with me. So if I am there in the evenings, I can speak and it, and it does it for me. So that way I can keep caught up on the charts because I'm creating billable documents. Things like uh, the Living Matrix you can use and it's great to keep your, your chart notes for your, for your own benefit, but if you've got somebody else who's treating patients with you, like my PA, and they need to see my note, or if I have to send it for billing, I need something that's uh, more concrete and more complete. And so we use a scribe in the room with me and Dragon Systems when they're not there. Uh, let's see. Okay. So I can't say enough about group health visits for two big reasons. Actually, I guess there's a third. But the first one is, it's the most fun that I have all week. You, you can kind of gauge by now, I certainly like to be the center of attention, right? And so for me, the personality fits to be able to get up in front of a class of just a few people once a week. I think I got a picture here. Shoot. Maybe it's gone. Um, we have a waiting room that is actually a classroom. It seats about 15 people. Um, I thought I had a picture. I apologize. Um, but every Thursday night at 6 o'clock for an hour and a half, we either have a class on hormones and everybody's getting their hormone test results with their written treatment plan that I did before the class and they paid a small functional medicine fee of 75 bucks before they ever showed up. And then we bill the insurance for an office visit for everybody who's there. And my MA is right there at the front of the room and she takes everybody's vitals and I hand them a piece of paper that basically is your review of systems. Uh, it lets them circle hormone related symptoms if they have any and then they give that piece of paper to the medical assistant who corrects their, collects their vitals and keeps the sheet and that's my office note. And then I have my medical assistant while I'm teaching the class go to the EMR and load that into a note. And when the class is done for these six or 12 people, I look at the note, it's already completed, I sign off at it and it's done. Now, if anything's out of whack with the vitals or somebody wants to see me, I will give them a couple of minutes one-on-one. -on -one. And then what I do is I make sure for every class, I walk around and say, I'm really glad you're here. And I put my hand on their shoulder and your exam for a 213 is strictly observational, right? No respiratory problems, you know, they're not heavy breathing, nothing like that. And so you've got your vitals, you've, you've laid your hand on the patient, they felt cared for, and you can spend your time educating the patients on some of the most complex things that will help them transform their health and do it with passion and have them walk out excited, 
right? So it is the best time I have all week. One of the most practice changing things that has happened over the last few years is starting a lifestyle medicine program with pulling in resources from the community. We have a nutritionist, a health coach, energy medicine practitioner, mindfulness meditation teacher, along with the doctors and the PA and the other people in our practice. We met these people through our functional forum meetup and it has been just life changing and just great for our patients and we love it. Thanks so much for watching the Functional Forum. We will be back next month with more information on stress and the brain is such an important topic, not just because this is something we can really do something about in functional medicine, but people like Mark Hyman and others are out there really getting the word out uh, to patients and they're ready to come to your practice. So we'll see you next month at the Functional Forum. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.